Thanks for joining us today at Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. We're lighting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen today as Pastor Green shares some biblical truths that will shine upon the true light, Jesus Christ. We're going to be reading today from Mark the second chapter. And if you will, follow along with me. It says, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days... And it was noised that he was in the house, and straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And Jesus preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof. Say they uncovered the roof. They took the roof off where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein that sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we ask you this morning... I just need your help to speak this word, to preach this word. Your word says the spirit of the Lord God is upon us because he has anointed us to preach the gospel to the meek. So, Lord, I pray today that you will anoint me to preach this word, for your word is anointed. And God, just anoint me as a vessel to preach this word and let your anointing rest upon your people as they receive it. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I tell you what, Jesus has the power to forgive sins. He has been given the power. It's not a hard thing for Jesus to forgive sins. He can heal the sick and he can forgive their sins too. He can heal both the body and he can heal the spirit. He can heal both. He still does the same things today that he did back then. Back then, you see what he was doing? What was Jesus doing here? He was forgiving men of their sins, and he was healing their bodies. So I say to you today, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. He's the same Jesus. He still forgives sins, and he still heals diseases. Verse 5 of this chapter says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, Thy sins be forgiven thee. So notice that Jesus calls this man son. He calls him son, which relates to a father and son. He calls him his son when he sees his faith. He saw his faith, how? By his friends around him, and him and his friends are coming through the roof. Now imagine if Jesus were standing here preaching to us this morning and all of a sudden somebody started sawing into the roof and and, and all of a sudden the roof opened up and we could see the heavens and here comes some people lowering down a man on a a bed right into Jesus' presence. That's exactly what happened that day. They took the roof to get to Jesus. And when Jesus saw that kind of faith, he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. He had to see their faith. When he saw his faith was in him, Jesus called him son 
And he said, your sins are forgiven. Now, the old scribes that were sitting there, y'all know them old scribes that were sitting there in the room, they were thinking and they were reasoning in their hearts that Jesus was speaking blasphemy when he said that because he had said, son, your sins are forgiven. And the, and the man, to the man that was sick with palsy, so they said, Jesus, they were thinking in their heart that who are you to forgive sins? You're not God. Only God can forgive sins. So they don't believe that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. They don't believe that he is God. The scribes were just reasoning in their hearts, you know, saying, who can forgive sins but God only? So who is this Jesus um, that has this claim that he can forgive men's sins? But Jesus perceived what they were thinking. He, he began to perceive what they were thinking in their hearts and what they were saying. And so he said, why do you reason these things in your hearts? Whether it's easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or is it easier to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk? He said the reason he's doing this is that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. The reason he does this is that people will know. You know, healing, when he did healings, healing wasn't the ultimate act or the ultimate miracle. The reason he did healings was to demonstrate what is not evident to the eye, which is forgiveness of sins. He was doing it to demonstrate his power. If I can heal this man then I also have the power to forgive his sins. So this is what he was demonstrating. And um, he said, arise. He said, I say unto thee, arise, take up your bed, and go your way into your own house. And it said that the man didn't hesitate for one minute. When the Lord spoke to him and said, arise, he leaped. He immediately, the word says, he immediately um, arose, took up his bed, and went forth before them all in so much that it says that in the word that they were all amazed and they all glorified God. So the works that Jesus did brought glory to God. And it amazed everybody. Not just the scribes that were there. It amazed everybody that was in the room that day. And they, they used the term here, we never saw it on this fashion. And how we would say that here in the south would be, we ain't never seen nothing like this before. <laughs> Come on. That's how we would say it. They all looked at it and they said, we ain't never seen nothing like this before. They had never seen anything like that before where Jesus demonstrated his power to, to heal the sick of the palsy. And immediately he jumps up. He's, he, he's paralyzed, y'all. He's paralyzed. Um, he can't walk. He has to be carried in. And Jesus just sees their faith. All he does is sees their faith, and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed and walk. It's just that simple. He did it. There was, it wasn't hard for him. He didn't have to pray a long time. It didn't take him 30 minutes or 45 minutes. It didn't take him even five minutes. It took Jesus just, just like that, and it was done. It was over. His sins were forgiven. His body was healed, and he went on his way. And I want to I tell you today that Jesus is the same. He can heal your body, and he can forgive your sins just like that. It's not a hard thing for him to do. Amen? But he's got to see that faith. Power. It says that Jesus claims to have power to heal the sick. Power here means authority. Jesus has the authority. You or someone can't forgive sins without the power or authority to, give it, to do it. I mean... You have to have authority to do it. And Jesus had that authority, and Jesus still has that authority today. The central focus of the story today that we're reading about is Jesus' authority. That's the central focus of this story, is Jesus' power or Jesus' authority. So I'm going to share with you, if you've got a pen and paper, I want you to jot these things down. I promise you they're going to be beneficial to you today. I'm going to give you five 
lessons that this story teaches us real briefly here. I'm going to give you just a minute to go ahead and get you a pen and paper. And I want you to jot these down for you because sometimes when you jot it down, you can remember it better. And it's sort of like it just seals it in your heart. Now, some of you I know has got great memories. I can stand here and teach it, and at the end of it, you can quote it all back to me. But I'm not like that. I have to write it down on paper and sort of go over it four or five times to even be able to remember it. But I'm going to share with you five lessons that this story teaches us. Okay, number one, here we go. Jesus is moved by man's faith. And not only for ourselves, but on the behalf of others. So what moves Jesus? Faith. And astoundingly, y'all, Jesus' authority was released when this man's friends had the faith also to bring him. You know, what if he said, I need some help getting me over to there. I believe if y'all can get me there that Jesus would help me. I believe his friends had faith with him or else they wouldn't have done all the works that they did. They had faith. So that tells us two important thing, things, that God recognizes our faith and God recognizes that our faith can make a difference for other people who are in need. So that's the number one lesson that I think we need to learn from this. The paralyzed man's friends brought him to Jesus. They believed too. What this teaches us is that we can help others. When our friends need help, our faith and works of faith is noticed by Jesus. And he responds to our faith not only for ourselves but for others. How many of you have ever made intercession for other people and God has helped them because you had faith for them. Maybe they didn't even have faith for their self. Maybe they didn't even have faith, but you prayed and God answered your prayer of faith for them. You know, in James it says, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let the elders pray the prayer of faith. And if this man has sinned, the Lord will forgive him of his sins and heal his body. And that's all on behalf of the prayer. The one who's doing the praying church. Are you seeing that? So Jesus confirmed it right here. His friends had faith for him. And Jesus honored the prayers of his friends. The faith of his friends. The works of faith were evident to him that his friends believed Jesus could do it too. Or they would have never took that roof off. Okay? That's radical faith. Somebody say radical faith. That's pretty radical. So this paralytic's friends had some radical faith. It's good for you to have some friends with radical faith. You need to surround yourself with people, with friends who are people of faith because they can be very helpful to you and you can be very helpful to them. And it was evident when they took that roof off and let that friend down right there in the presence of Jesus where he was standing and was preaching the very word. And they were confident. They were persistent. They were determined. They knew if they could get their friend to Jesus that Jesus would heal him. They didn't think it. They knew it. They absolutely, faith knows. Faith does not think God can do something. Faith believes God will do it. I believe that they felt this very thing. If we can get him to Jesus on that platform or wherever he was standing in that house, if we can just get him there, Jesus will heal him. And when he saw their faith, all he had to see was their faith. And he forgave him and healed him. All he had to see was their faith. I tell you what God looks for when he's forgiving and when he's healing people. He's looking for faith. Without faith, you cannot receive anything from the Lord. Can't receive anything. Although the Lord is compassionate on all people, not all people can get healed. He looks for the faith in that person. And even among the friends. That's why we have to pray for our friends when they're in need. How many of you have ever been in need and it's hard to pray for yourself? You pick up the phone and call somebody and say, I just need some help. I need you to pray for me. And they can pray a bold prayer of faith for you. And you, you've been through something so long, you can't even pray in faith no more. It looks impossible. 
And you've got somebody else over here, boy, they just believe God's going to zap you, hit you, and you're going to be healed in Jesus' name. You're going to jump, leap, and run again. And they're just praying this bold prayer. And the power of God hits you as a result of their faith. Seen it many times happen. We see it again here. So they knew it and they acted in faith. And I call this radical faith. Amen. Number two. We need forgiveness of sins even more than we need healing for our bodies. If you'll notice here, although Jesus can heal our bodies and he delights to, the reason he does so is to turn us in our hearts to the kingdom of God. The reason Jesus heals our bodies is in order to turn our hearts to him and to the kingdom of God. In verse 10, Jesus explained why he did this. He said, I did this that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He's explaining why he healed the paralytic. He didn't just heal the paralytic just for the sake of his body. He had a bigger agenda. He had a more important agenda. He said that you may know I did it as a display to all of you here to know that if I can heal his body, I can forgive his sins. So to Jesus, the healing of our bodies are important, but not more important than the forgiveness of our sins. Your body's going to be healed when you get to heaven anyway. But he will heal your body because he loves you and he's compassionate. And he will heal your body. The signs and the miracles that Jesus did were to turn men's hearts to him and to the kingdom of God. He wanted them to see what he did and be turned to him and believe in him. Reckon how many other people believed in him when they saw all of this that day. You reckon he got those believers that were standing in that room? Maybe he had some that mocked him, some scoffers. But I tell you what, they had a, a whole lot more um, trouble explaining how Jesus could do that. Those scribes must have had a little bit more difficult time convincing those that did believe that were sitting in that room. And, and they might have had a conversation like this. Well, well, just explain to me then how he did it. How did he heal the paralytic? How did he set that man free? You tell me. And they couldn't explain it. So he did it to demonstrate his power and authority, church. Jesus did it to demonstrate his power and authority for more of a reason than just his body. He wanted to show them who he was, that he was God. And he said the Son of Man. He's also the Son of Man. He said the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. That is that you may know. This is that you may know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive men's sins on the earth. He's letting us know. It was the physical healing here that got the crowds so excited. Amen? They were so excited. But Jesus used the miracle to direct the crowds to the kingdom of God. And to the forgiveness of the sins, the healing of the spiritual man also. He wasn't solely focused on just going around and healing people's bodies just for the sake of the body. Am I making sense? Just not for just the sake of the body. There was a bigger purpose of God. And it was to draw men to the kingdom of God. To turn them to the kingdom of God. To turn their hearts to him. That they might believe on him and believe on his father. Amen. <laughs> they were all amazed. It must have worked. Must have worked. Look at verse 12. They were all amazed and all glorified God. That would mean the scribes too. The scribes were in there, right? They were all amazed, even the scribes. And they all glorified God, even the scribes. Did it work? It must have because it said they glorified him. They were all amazed and, and when it used all amazed, and it said, and glorified God. And they said, we've never seen anything like this. 
So this is how we ought to be still today. That we all give God the glory for his amazing grace and his mercies, for his power and for his authority, and for his healing and for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Would you just give God some glory right now and just say, thank you, Lord, that you're able and you're willing. He's willing to heal bodies, but he's also willing to forgive sins. He has the power and authority to do both. That's the message today. We're just going to entitle today's message, Jesus still forgives and heals. Come on. Say it with me. Jesus still forgives and heals. If you need forgiveness today, Jesus will forgive you. He needs to see your faith, though. He's got, he needs to see you step in faith and believe him that he will forgive you and ask for forgiveness, and he'll forgive you immediately. Jesus said, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, he says, I will cleanse you from everything in your life that is not con in conformity with my will for you in thought, deed, and word. Imagine that your every thought is in conformity with God. Imagine your every word is in conformity with God. Imagine every work you do is in conformity with God. God promises that if we will confess our sins when we sin, that he is faithful and he is just to forgive us. And it didn't say and stop there forgive you and leave you like that. I'll forgive you and I'll go on and I will cleanse, which means remove from you everything that is in you that is not in conformity with me. How many of you know there's probably many times we're not in conformity with the Lord in our thoughts? But the Lord said, I'll cleanse you. If you'll confess your sin, I'll cleanse you. How many of you think... Maybe there's times in your life you're not in conformity with the Lord in your words. <laughs> now, I, can, I know I'm not. And there's times, even recently, I said, Lord, forgive me for what I said. Or what, what about this? Lord, forgive me for what I thought. I confess that was a sinful thought. That was a wrong thought. That was an ugly thought. That was a mean thought. <laughs> if you confess it to him, he said, I'll cleanse you. I'll remove it from you. And I will bring you to a place in me through my power and your willingness to confess your sin to me and repent of it and say you're sorry for it. He said, I will, on that faith that I see of you in me, I will cleanse you from everything that is not in conformity in you of thought, of word, and of deed. So is there any reason to just continue in sin? That grace would abound? God forbid. The word of God says God forbid that we should continue in sin just so grace would abound. I've heard people say the stupidest things. They say, well, you know, I'm just those sinners saved by grace and we're all going to sin. We might as well just... You can't explain other verses that says, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Apart from Christ, there is none righteous, no, not one. But I believe we can grow. Come on, I believe we can grow. I believe we can mature in Christ. We will never mature in Christ if we are unwilling to confess our own sins and mistakes to God and Christ. You'll just stop growing right there. You'll just stay right there until you admit your wrongdoings. But when you admit them, he forgives them. And then he cleanses. He removes them from you. Hallelujah. And then we don't have to keep on going through the same thing again and again and again. You know why many have never overcome and come past that? Because they've not yet repented it was their sin. They, they're full of busyness of blaming everybody else for why they're doing what they're doing and not owning it themselves. It was my sin that nailed him there. Come on, it was my sin. The psalmist David said, I have sinned. I 
I did it. He admitted it, and the Lord was quick to forgive him. He fell. He, he fell into temptation. He committed adultery. He was quick to admit it. He didn't go around blaming, well, she shouldn't have been bathing down there by the river, and I wouldn't have fell. That's that Adamic nature in us. It's Adamic, all right. It's Adamic. It'll damn you to hell to believe that. Adam sinned willfully. Eve was deceived, which was worse. Everybody wants to make a big deal out of Eve was deceived. Well, Adam knew better and still did it. She was deceived. She said, at least had a reason. He didn't have no reason. He knew better. God had told him. He knew better and still did it. So I've heard people say, well, you don't want to listen to women because, you know, they are easily deceived. <laughs> and that's men talking that willfully sin <laughs> and know better. I mean, what I'm talking about is the, the nature of Adam. That nature is to blame others. You know, when God confronted Adam about sinning, you know what he said? That woman that you gave me, he pointed to two people in his life, the two people. When God confronted him, he said, it was that woman that you gave me that caused me to do this. He did not take responsibility for his own sin. So I'm here to tell you today, when you sin, own it. Amen. Own it. Don't blame everybody else for the way you are. You made me do this. You made me do that. You made me mad. You made me cuss. You made me do this. It was my sin that nailed him there. It was your sin that nailed him there. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Only a person that's full of their self, that's full of pride, only a person that's full of pride cannot admit that. A person full of pride will never admit their mistakes. They will never own them. They will never say, I'm sorry. They will never, ever think for one second that they could have done anything wrong. But now, wrong is determined by if God says it was wrong. Not by what a person says. A person might say, you did wrong. God might say, no, you didn't. So it's important to know what God has to say about it. Amen? God knows our heart. Number three. The, number third le the third lesson that we need to learn from this uh, story today is speaking the word of God will usually invite criticism and opposition. How many of you know when Jesus started speaking the word, remember he was, standing, he was standing up in the room and he was preaching the word. And then when he said the words, Son, thy sins are forgiven, he immediately experienced by the scribes in the room what? Criticism. An opposition, it started in their hearts. Now, a lot of times when I'm preaching the word, a lot of times the word will bring about a certain criticism and opposition to it in the room. Not by all men's hearts, but by some men's hearts. And sometimes you can perceive it. Hmm. Sometimes I'll be preaching and I can perceive that somebody don't like what I'm saying. Sometimes their face doesn't express it, but the Holy Spirit will sort of cause me to be able to perceive, ooh, they do not like what you're saying right now. But it's the word that they don't like. It's the word is, the Holy Ghost is taking the word and he's sort of uh, convicting their hearts. Their hearts are being convicted by the word. The Holy Spirit is doing his work and he's releasing the word. It's being released like Jesus did. So the scribes didn't believe that Jesus was God. So they had this unbelief in them. They did not believe the truth. They did not know the truth. They didn't know the truth about Jesus. So when Jesus spoke those words, they started criticizing him and they started opposing him. So I want you to know this, just in everyday life, when you start speaking the word of God, when I get up here to speak the word of God, when I'm preaching the word of God, when I'm teaching the word of God, I fully expect that I'm stirring some folks up to come back and criticize me and oppose me. It does not even surprise me. It don't surprise me that people get mad at me when I preach the word. 
It, it doesn't. Jesus was not surprised that the scribes was mad. It said he perceived in his heart what they were thinking. Who is he to forgive man's sins? He's not God, and only God alone can do that. Blasphemy. He's committing blasphemy. All he was doing was telling the truth. But because the truth was not in those scribes, the Father was not in those scribes. So they criticized him and they opposed him. But I believe by the time he finished demonstrating his power and authority, I'm going to hope that as verse 12 shows us, that they were all amazed and they all glorified God. That those unbelieving scribes become believers that day. If we should pray for God's power to be demonstrated, it should be for the saving of men's souls above it all. Amen? Mm -mm -mm. Somebody say this is a good word today. This is good stuff right here. This is some good stuff. Amen. Look at number, we're going to look for number four here. Number four. Jesus' authority to heal men's physical problems demonstrated and visibly verified his authority to also forgive men's sins. I'm going to say it again. Jesus' authority to heal men physically as he did the paralytic. It demonstrated and visibly verified his power, right? Come on. It, they couldn't deny that. Like, if Jesus said your sins are forgiven, how do we know his sins were forgiven? We didn't see nothing. If I said, Barry, your sins are forgiven. I mean, if I had the power to do it and I said, forgiven Barry says okay but there's nothing demonstrated there's nothing visibly evident to verify that his sins are forgiven so Jesus could have stopped there and said all right paralytic man your sins are forgiven and and he would have went to heaven and lived in a, a bad body lived paralyzed for the rest of his life and when he got to heaven he'd have, he'd have been made whole and which would have been good but Jesus went a step further and healed him in order to demonstrate and visibly verify his power to those people that were sitting in that room that day. So that's the number four one. Jesus' authority to heal men physically demonstrates and visibly verifies that he also has the authority to forgive sins. Healing is visibly verifiable, whereas forgiveness of sins is not. So Jesus used his power to heal and to demonstrate his power to forgive sins. He said, which is easier? When Jesus said, which is easier, he was implying both were easy. <laughs> That's all he was saying. He said, which is easier? Which is easier for me to do? He just made it look like this is so easy. It is so easy for Jesus to do anything. See, sometimes we've been in a condition so long that we think it's hard for God to heal us. It's not hard for God to do anything. But I tell you what he looks for. Faith. When he saw their faith, he said, Son, Thy sins are forgiven. And arise, take up your bed, and walk. Mm -mm -mm. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Have you ever received a healing, but you had to step out in faith in order to receive? The woman with the issue of blood, 
There was a woman who for 12 long years had hemorrhaged. She had bled for 12 years, and during the 12 years, she had went to every doctor and spent all her money, and the final word for her was, Honey, go home. There's nothing we can do to stop your bleeding. And she made her way to Jesus. And she said in her heart, I know that if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And therefore, in faith, the woman pursued him. She got to where he was, and then she found a crowd was there. She found obstacles in her way everywhere, but she was determined to get to him. She kept saying, I know if I can just get to him, I'll get healed. I know if I can just get to him, I, he's going to heal me. Because, you know, Jesus is such a healing Jesus. He delights in healing. He's compassionate. He is full of compassion. He is merciful. He is kind. So she got to where Jesus was because she heard he was passing through. She got to where he was going to be passing through, and there was a crowd there. And they were pressed in on Jesus from every side. And the woman got down on her hands and knees. And she pressed her way through the crowd. I can see her now. Excuse me. Pardon me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Pardon me. Excuse me. Sorry. Excuse me. And she's down on her hands and knees, crawling through the crowds. And looking to see if she can find Jesus' feet or the hem of his garment. And then she saw his feet. And she grabbed the hem of his garment. And Jesus said, who touched me? And the disciples, one of the disciples said, Jesus, everybody's touching you. <laughs> what are you talking about? Everybody's, and he said, no, virtue just went out of me. See, when she pulled on him with faith, something left his body and went into her body. And it was the power of God that heals and she was instantly made whole. He didn't do nothing. He didn't heal her. He said, woman, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. He didn't say, I just picked you out of a crowd and I want to heal you and I don't want to heal you and I want to heal you and I don't want to heal you. He said, your faith has made you whole. It was your faith that made you whole. What you did, your faith, your belief in me and what you did to get to me Healed you. Whew. That's how the story ought to be told. That's how the message goes. And then she got up and just started telling him all about what, had she, what she had been through. and She glorified him. And from that instant, she was healed. In an instant, she stopped bleeding. The woman had bled for 12 long years. Do y'all know what that must have been like to live like that back in those days? She got, she was healed. The moment she touched the hem of his garment, he said, I felt virtue go out of me. The power of God. The power of God healed her. The power of God went into her, from him into her, and she was immediately healed. My God, my God. Healing and miracles are secondary to forgiveness of sins. You know, some people make a big deal out of healings, and they are big deals. But the greatest of all miracles is when Jesus forgives us of our sins. That's the greatest miracle that will ever happen to you in your life. The greatest miracle that ever takes place in us is to be a sin-sick soul and Jesus to say, Son, Thy, thy sins are forgiven of thee. Your sins are in the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, 
I will remember them no more. The greatest of all miracles was when my Jesus saved me. Hallelujah. This is good word. This is the truth. He cares about your human body, your human needs. He cares about your physical needs. He cares about your emotional needs. But above all, he cares about your spiritual needs. Some people put a whole lot more emphasis, they're a whole lot more worried about their bodies being healed than they are their sins being forgiven. Uh, I'm going to tell you this. A lot of people will fill an auditorium with 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50,000 people if they hear there's going to be a miracle healing service. But just tell the same people that Jesus is going to be there and forgive their sins. And, and you'd be fortunate to even fill the house with 1,000 or 5,000 people. That's just the nature of man. That human nature. But here's the good news. Jesus will do, wants to do, what he did for the paralytic, and that's both. He could have just said your sins are forgiven. Get up and go home. When you die, you'll be made whole. Then you can go to heaven. Be happy. Don't want too much. You really do want a lot, don't you? You want me to forgive your sins and heal you? Well, I'm not only going to do one thing. I'm going to forgive your sins. No, Jesus did it all. When you're made whole, it's body, soul, mind, and spirit. Everything healed. Nothing missing. Nothing lacking. He'll heal your body. He'll save your soul. He'll give you peace of mind and make you ever wit whole. Amen. That's what Jesus will do. What do we have the faith to believe him for? That's what I ask you. What do you have the faith to believe God for? What do you have the faith to press into him for? What do you want God to do for you? What do you believe God can do for you? You know, if I don't believe that God can do something for me, then I'm not going to spend much of my time pressing in to get it done, right? But if I believe that God can do it and will do it, then what am I going to do? Would I go to the ends of the earth if I had to to get to him? If I was desperate enough for my healing? The woman with the issue of blood was desperate. The paralytic was desperate. You can get to a place of desperation. The paralytic was to the place of desperation. He was desperate. To tear the roof off of the house is pretty desperate. To get down on your knees and crawl through a crowd is pretty desperate for a woman bleeding from 12 years. But those were the ones that got what they came for. What about blind Bartimaeus? Blind Bartimaeus was on the wayside begging. Somebody help me. He had to have men lead him because he was blind. But when he heard that Jesus was passing through, he cried, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd said, shh, be quiet. You're bothering Jesus. And he said, hey, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he cried the louder. The more they told him to shut up, he saw them as, as hindering his healing. He meant he was going to get it. He didn't really care if anybody liked what he was doing or not. I don't think the paralytic cared whether anybody in that house liked that he was tearing the roof off of their house or not. I don't think he really cared if they had a tore up roof and had to call the adjuster to come adjust it and get it fixed or not. He was desperate. Just tear the roof off. When you get desperate, you go to desperate measures. But I want you to know today before you leave this church, I want you to know that with God there is nothing impossible. And let me finish the sentence. To those who believe. Everything's impossible to those who don't believe. But nothing is impossible with God. To those who believe. When you believe God, 
The limits are off as to what God can do for you. You may have a dream or a vision that there's no way in earth or in heaven that it could ever come to pass except God. That would be called a God kind of vision. That you know that it will never happen unless God does it. But you can believe God for it. And God can bring it to pass. He is not limited by what you have or what you don't have. He's not limited by what I have or what I don't have. God has resources that he can get to you. Remember when Elijah was in the famine? But he was serving God and he was obeying God. So God, he was not limited. God commanded the ravens. He commanded them to get meat and bring it to his prophet Elijah in the times of famine. He provided him water by the brook. And then eventually he sent him to a widow's house. And it wasn't for his sake. God had been providing for him and would have kept on providing for him. He didn't need what the widow had, but the widow needed what he had. The widow needed what he had. The widow needed to sow something into the man and the prophet of God for her own self to live. He said, and, and, and the prophet Elijah came to the widow's house and, and uh, she had enough oil and flour for a hoe cake, one hoe cake. And he said, what do you have in your house? And she said, I've got enough in the oil container and in the flour bin to make one more hoe cake. And I was about to make it. And me and my son, we were going to eat it together. And then we were going to die. That's how desperate she was. That's that's, that was her destiny. There was no more food. There was a famine in the land. There was nowhere to go buy it. You have to know the picture here. The land is not producing. It's not yielding. There's nothing to eat. There's nothing to drink. She's got one, one hoe cake's worth of groceries in the house. And her, I tell you, God sent him just in time. God will send you help just in time. And he comes, and, and this is what he says. What do you have in your house? And she said, i got enough for this. He said, this is what I want you to do. He said, I want you to cook that hoe cake. He said, but I want you to break off the first portion and give it to me. And then you and your son eat the rest. Now, if she had have been faithless, she would have said, you ain't getting none of my hoe cake. Who are you to ask me for the first portion? But she didn't. She baked the hoe cake, and she believed the prophet. She believed that if she gave the first portion of whatever she had over to the man of God, that God was going to pronounce a blessing on her and her son, and they would live even through the famine. And that's exactly what happened. It said for the next three and a half years, there was a famine in the land. And every day that she went to dip in her oil bucket, there was new oil. That's a supernatural manifestation of God. That is supernatural. We don't serve a natural God. We serve a supernatural God. He is not limited by what we can produce. He can produce oil. Hey, hey he can produce oil. He can put flour in there. He can cause it. To refill and replenish. And she lived while other widows in the land died. The other widows died. This widow lived. Her and her son lived. And God provided for them. All because she believed the prophet. The prophet came speaking the word of the Lord. The, word, the Lord sent him there. Told him what to do. Tell her to give you the first portion. If she does it, I'll see her faith. Woo! -hoo. He saw her faith. Come on, he saw her faith. It had to be demonstrated. 
when she cooked the hoe cake and she took her hand and she broke off part of that hoe cake knowing that was her last meal with her son and she handed it to the prophet Elijah. She put that in his hands. That meant everything to her. But she did it in faith and God rewarded her faith and he supernatural, supernaturally provided for her in that famine. And she and her son did live. Glory to God. That's what faith can do. Amen. Amen. He can move mountains. Amen. God is good. God is good. Number five. And this is the last one. Jesus' power and authority will always bring glory to God. If you'll notice, as we read the story, everything that Jesus did was to bring glory to God. So when we see the power of God demonstrated, it's not to bring glory to man. You know, and some men seek to get God's glory. So it's not man, it's not man's church, but God's and the kingdom of God that God is bringing the glory to we can never take upon ourselves the glory that is due to god forgetting that can be dangerous it can be very dangerous when we take god's glory just say god chose to use you to demonstrate his power through you maybe he used you to pray for someone and they got healed Maybe God used you to lay your hands on someone that was sick and God healed them. The most important thing to remember is that his power and his authority is always to bring glory to God, not to man. So we can never take his glory. The Lord will freely give, but he will not share his glory. I'm telling you, the Lord will freely forgive sins. The Lord will freely heal the sick. But the one thing the Lord will not do, he will not share his glory with those who attempt to take credit for that which only he can do. See, I've heard people, I've been in services where a man of God prays for someone and they get healed. And then the person turns around and hugs their neck and cries and says, thank you for healing me. He healed me. And I've seen them say this. Ma'am, I did not heal you. I cannot heal anyone. The Lord healed you. They rebuked the person for even giving them credit in ignorance. If anybody ever praises you or gives you the glory for God's power, you don't need to take it. Don't let that come on you. As long as you keep yourself humble and know that it's God's power, and know that God's the one that heals and saves and forgives and all of that. As long as we do that and we confer the glory and praise on him, God will use you. But it's a dangerous thing to try to take his glory. God's works are for his glory. So just be sure to always give him his glory. I want to say this today. If you have a need today, if you're sitting here today and you have a need, I want you to know that you know, the Lord is present here with us this morning. The presence of the Lord is here right now. The Lord is here to save. The Lord is present to forgive sins. If you've never had your sins forgiven, all you have to say is, Jesus, I come to you. I believe that you have the authority to forgive sins, that only you have the authority. God has given Jesus the authority to heal sins. Right now, he can forgive your sins just like that. It's an easy thing to do. All we have to do is confess or admit them and tell the Lord we're sorry and turn to him, and he will then give us the power to live a godly life. Amen. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to forgive you, don't wait another second. Just say a prayer of faith. He will hear the prayer of faith. And he will forgive you and write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. We hope you were blessed by today's message. For more messages, to contact us, send your prayer request, 
or to make donations to support this outreach ministry, go to lighthouseoutreach.org or download our app on iTunes, Google, or any Android device. If you're ever in our area, we invite you to visit us at 9437 West U.S. Highway 84, about seven miles west of Ross Park Circle in Dothan, Alabama.